Hey, good morning and welcome to Mid-City Church Online. My name is Pastor Fernie and I'm the pastor here at Mid-City Church. I am so glad you're worshiping with us today. I know that uh, you could probably be doing a hundred different things, but uh, you chose to worship with us and I am so thankful. Today I'm going to share a sermon about the wrath of God in the face of forgiveness and and, uh, how that works and what that means for us. And I I hope that uh, you will be challenged today and that you will take away a little bit more assurance that you are forgiven. Well, as we enter into worship this morning, will you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks uh, that we get to gather uh, through uh, online, uh, and I'm just so thankful for that. God, I pray for every single person watching, for those who couldn't be here, for those who are traveling, for those who are in between jobs. I pray for uh, all people in all places this morning. May your grace and your presence abound in all of our lives. God, be in our time together, and uh, God, I just give you thanks. I pray this in your most precious and most glorious name. Amen.
Well, as our band continues to lead us in worship this morning, I, I, I want to lead us into this time of offering. Uh, at Mid-City Church, we believe that giving is a spiritual practice. It's an opportunity for us to be generous with what God has given us. And I know that this time can be scary. And uh, for some of us, we've had some, some uh, financial hardships and difficulties. And so I want to tell you this. When we talk about giving, it's not about the amount of the gift. I'm not here to question how much you are giving. I, I want to invite you to, to, to pray about the gift of the gift, the, the heart of the gift. To, to, to pray about, uh, is, there, is there anything that you can be generous with of what God has given you? And here's why I want to invite you to do this, for two reasons. One, I think uh, generosity is an important practice that all of us need to practice. So I, I am doing it as well, and, and I want to invite you to, to join me in that practice. The second reason is every time you give a gift, it goes to help support the ministry of Mid-City Church. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't go to pay anybody's salaries. It doesn't go to pay overhead. It goes to support the ministry of Mid-City Church. And so our online services, our small groups, uh, our, our, our um, service opportunities in the, in the community, uh, we really want to invite you to consider giving because it'll help us do a whole lot more. And so there's three ways that you can give this morning. One, you can send a check to our main campus, uh, 930 North Boulevard, and, and uh, just make sure that in the memo it says Mid-City Church. A second way you can do that is by texting the letters MCCBR, again that's MCCBR for Mid-City Church Baton Rouge, uh, to the number 22525. And the, the third way you can give is by going to our website, uh, midcity.church, www.midcity.church, and just click on the giving uh, tab on the right. And, uh, and it'll take you to a page and you can give from there. Um, we really wanted to make giving as easy as possible, and so that's why there's so many options. And uh, if you missed any of that, there's a screen on your, there's a graphic on your screen right now for you to be able to follow. Well, as we continue into worship, will you join me in prayer as we bless our offering? Gracious and loving God, I, we give this offering up to you. God, may it be used to share your love with all people. May it be used to continue to spread your kingdom. May it be used so that people can continue to gather and worship and grow in small groups and give their lives in service. May it be used so that people may find life and purpose in you. God, bless this offering. And I pray that as we practice this spiritual practice of generosity, God, that we may learn to trust you with more and more of our lives. God, we give you thanks. Amen.
So there's a Christian comedian named John Christ, and I have uh, followed him for a while now. I think his videos are uh, pretty funny. He, uh, his bit, as he likes to call it, is uh, to call out hypocrisy among people. Uh, so he has, you know, hypocrisy about Disney and uh, uh, family life. And I think one of my favorites is when he talks about Christianity. Uh, you know, I also like this guy because uh, when, when he's doing his comedy show and begins to talk about biblical characters and, and Christian life, uh, it, it's clear to see that he knows his Bible. He knows what's in it and he knows the characters and he knows the stories. And uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's fun to watch. And uh, so he's one of those uh, comedians that uh, every once in a while I'll be scrolling through my Instagram and I'll see video and I'll watch it and I'll laugh and then just move on. I'm not a diehard follower. So earlier this week, I was uh, scrolling through Instagram and I saw a video from John Christ and I thought, oh wow, I haven't seen any of his videos in a long time. Uh, I wonder what happened. So I clicked on it and he started talking and, and it was a, a very serious video. And I've got to be honest with you, what I saw kind of uh, really shocked me. Uh, it's not by any means was I expected to hear. You see in this video, John Christ uh, uh, started to apologize. He said that uh, he had uh, not posted anything in uh, over eight months, which was weird for him because he used to post something every single day. He mentioned that he was in uh, treatment, so he uh, a treatment for four months. He, did, he wasn't specific about what the treatment was for, but he said he was in a treatment facility for four months. And, um, you know, he kept asking for forgiveness, and he said stuff like, the very people I didn't expect to forgive me were the very people who forgave me. And, and I, I got very curious as to what he was talking about, what had happened, what the whole uh, issue was. And so I got online, I got on Google, and I went down this rabbit hole of uh, what happened to John Christ. And I got to tell you what I found was kind of shocking. I found that uh, a lot of women had accused him of uh, manipulation, of uh, uh, assault. It's like sexual assault. Um, uh, and and, I, and I, I just I was like, okay, so so I wanted to read deeper into it. And um, here's what I realized: John had used his pattern, uh, his platform, as a way of um, as a way to connect with women to eventually, or uh, for the purpose of, becoming physically intimate with them. That was the pattern that I kind of began to piece together as I read story after story, and, uh, and even stories of uh, his own uh, manager, and, and just, just I began to piece the whole, all the stories together. I mean, there was one woman in particular that really caught my attention she said, yeah, what, what John was doing at first felt a little weird and, and uncomfortable, but, but he's a Christian guy, right? I mean, what's a Christian guy going to do to me? So as I read all these reports and all these stories, I decided I'm going to go back and watch uh, his Instagram video where he's asking for forgiveness. And by the time I went back, the, the video had over 7,000 comments. A lot of comments on there. It was hard to uh, read through all of them, but I started reading through some and there were some things that, uh, some comments I read that really stood out to me. One of them simply said, grace abounds. There was another one uh, that said, at least now you're aware of your sins. Just get better from here. There was one that said, don't worry, John, God forgives everything. But this was my favorite. This person wrote, we all have sinned. And we all fall short of the glory of God. But you are forgiven. Does it sound familiar to you? I'm not going to lie. As I was reading through all these comments, I got a little uncomfortable. I had a hard time breathing as I read through these comments. Because, uh, look, those comments aren't wrong. Yes, grace does abound. Yes, God does forgive. Just last week, I preached a sermon about how it's important to be aware of our sins because it is in that awareness that we can move forward. Two weeks ago, I preached a sermon 
in which I said we've all sinned and we all fall short, but in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven. See, these words felt comfortable as I preached them a couple weeks ago, but earlier this week, as I was reading through uh, John's stories and, and, and the women, and, and I was reading through uh, educating myself on all this, I started to wonder, what if that had happened to my wife or my sister or my niece or a friend of mine? What if a friend of mine had been in that situation and, and then all of a sudden they heard somebody tell to the person who hurt them, who manipulated them, who, who uh, caused pain in their lives, if all of a sudden that person was told, don't worry, you're forgiven. Don't worry, we all fall short. At least you're aware now. I've been wrestling with the words I've said the last couple of weeks and, and with where I am today. And look, I've got to be honest with you. I, the question I've been asking myself and really wrestling with is, okay, if God does forgive us, if God loves us and forgives us, right, is that the end to it? Is that the end for, for everybody, right? If we, if we sin, we, we fall short, and God forgives us, and that's it. We go about our lives like if nothing happened. Is that really the way the story goes? I think the answer is no. You see, I think there's a whole lot more to the story than just that. See, when we talk about forgiveness... I've said it the last couple of weeks, but when we talk about forgiveness, we tend to talk about a God who loves us, a God who loves us so much that forgives us at all costs. And, and if you read through scripture, you will find scripture all over the place that talks about that and, and, and points to that. I've really been wrestling with this all week. Is that all there is to God when it comes to forgiveness? A God who loves and just expects us to keep moving forward like nothing happened. See, I think it's true that God is a God of love. But I think there is also such a thing as the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Let's talk about this for a second. Because we can't deny the fact that throughout Scripture, it is as if God responds with wrath to so many things. Story after story after story where people commit sin. They live their life in sin. It seems like God's response to it is wrath. Now look, I know that sounds scary, but I actually think that uh, acknowledging that there is such a thing as the wrath of God is actually good news for us, is actually freeing for us. See, if we believe that God is only a God of love and that's it, that God loves us and forgives us and, and, and we move on from that, then we fall into this trap of believing that uh, th th our sins don't really matter, right? We're forgiven anyway, so what's the point? God loves us anyway, so just do whatever you want. But I don't think, I really don't believe that that's who God is. There has to be more to it than that. Right? But if it's just the opposite, if God is just a God of wrath, then there's no room for mistake. If God is just a God of wrath, there's no room for grace. See, if God is just a God of wrath, then we're supposed to be perfect. Because wrath leaves no room for error, right? See, I think God is a God of love, but God is also a God who responds with wrath to the sin in our lives. See, let's talk about these two for a second. 
because they sound like they're in conflict with one another, but they're actually in play together with one another. See, when we talk about God being a God of love, we talk about love being a permanent attribute of who God is. God is love. There's no doubt about that. There's no question about that. God is love. Now, let me be, let me be careful with this. When we talk about God loving you and me, it's not this gushy, mushy feeling that God loves us. No, it's, it's much deeper than that. Here's how Dallas Willard puts it. Dallas Willard says that when we talk about God's love, we're talking about agape love, a Greek word agape, and this is how he defines that word. Agape love is to love, is a kind of love in which you will the good of another. Agape love. To love is to will the good of another. See, when we talk about God being a loving God, we talk about the fact that uh, we talk about the fact that uh, God is not just this mushy, lovey, dubby kind of God towards us. We we talk about this uh, idea that God will stop at nothing for our well being. That God wants nothing but the best for us. That's what we mean when we talk about God being a God of love, a God who wants the best for us. And and we have to admit, that's a permanent attribute of God. And we want that. We want God to be permanently love towards us, right? That that be who God is at all times. And that's that's what uh, Dallas Willard argues, that this is a permanent attribute of who God is. Now, wrath, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Wrath is not a permanent attribute of God. It is a reaction, a response from God towards sin. See, attributes are permanent. Responses are not. Wrath is a response, not an attribute. Wrath is an action. Wrath is what God does. Wrath is not. Who God is. You see, when sin and evil are present in our lives, God responds to it with wrath. And essentially what God says is, I don't want that in your life. I don't want that for you. And we need to get rid of it. Now, look, I don't know about you, but I want a God who hates sin and evil who, who, who goes against and stands against everything that is bad in this world. I want God's wrath because that means that God is against everything that is bad in this world. This is how James Bryant Smith, uh, Bryant Smith uh, defines God's wrath. He says, wrath, God's wrath is a mindful, objective, and rational response to sin. Let me say that one more time. He says, God's wrath is a mindful, objective, and rational response to sin. See, when we talk about God's wrath, we don't talk about this uh, erratic kind of uh, wrath that uh, all of us as humans tend to experience, right? That wrath usually implies that we've lost control and we're angry and we're willing to do whatever we can to get the anger out. But but what, what James Bryan Smith says, it's the opposite. That's how humans deal with wrath. But but the way wrath is supposed to be, the way it lives through God, is in a mindful, objective, and rational way against sin. God looks at the sin in your life and in my life. And he, he, he goes to whatever length necessary to remove that sin in our life. Our dog, Zoe, likes to get in the trash. And we've bought locks and we've bought weights uh, to put on top of it. We've hidden the trash can at times. We try to take the trash out every single day. But whenever we forget, somehow she manages to get into the trash can every single time. Anger would mean that I lash out against her. 
I yell at her, I spank at her, I, right? I, that's what anger would look like for any of us. But God's wrath looks very different. God's wrath looks like putting more and more weight on the trash can. Right? God's wrath says, this isn't good for you. Let's remove this. God's wrath says, you're better than this. God's wrath says, I don't want uh, the, the repercussions of that for you. God's wrath is very different than our very human response of anger. Now look, I've got to be honest. I have a hard time uh, balancing these two, right? Uh, I, I think I kind of separate them, right? I like the idea of a loving God as long as it's in relationship to me and my sins. But I like the idea, and let's be honest, you might too. I like the idea of a wrathful God when it comes to someone else. If you have hurt me, you should face the God of wrath. But if, if it's me, then maybe the God of love shows up. But here's, let's be honest, uh, I want you to hear this. That is a wrong interpretation of who God is. God is a God of love who loves us at all times and will always offer us forgiveness. But God also responds with wrath towards our sin. Who wants, us, who wants to help us remove sin in our lives. Who wants us to not be slaves to sin or to our past. Who wants us to experience complete forgiveness. God's wrath enters into our lives and says, I don't want that for you anymore. There's a scripture in the book of Romans, in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 22. And I'm going to tell you, as I was reading this scripture, uh, this idea of a God who is both uh, a, a loving God and a God who responds with wrath at the same time uh, towards our sin, uh, this, this scripture helped me picture that a little bit better. So let me read this to you. This is chapter, Romans chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. Note then, the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness towards you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And even those of Israel, if they do not persist in, persist in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Again, that's from Romans chapter 11. I want to encourage you to read the entire chapter because it's very powerful. But I want to see if you caught this. Paul is talking about uh, the Israelites and the Gentiles. The, the Israelites are God's chosen people. Right from the very beginning, we're told that they are God's chosen people. And he compares them to branches on an olive tree. This is earlier in chapter 11. He compares them to branches on an olive tree, right? And, and God is the olive tree, and they're all connected to God. And Paul says some of them have fallen, right? They've broken off. And, and we can assume, and Paul kind of goes into it a little bit, but we can assume that the, them breaking off and falling off is a result of their sin, right? They've been cut off because they rejected God because they chose their own way over God's way, because uh, they allowed sin to consume them. And when sin consumes us, we get cut off. And so Paul begins to paint this picture. And he says, for every branch that is broken, you can be grafted in uh, to the, this, this tree, this, this olive tree. It doesn't matter if you're from a different uh, tree. It doesn't matter if, you, uh, who you are, like, uh, if you're a Gentile. He says, you can be grafted into this tree. And then he goes on and he says, and, and for the Israelites who turn from their ways, they can be grafted too. Now, look, I've read this scripture a hundred times probably. I love the book of Romans, but I have never quite understood this text. And so I did a little bit of research and, and, I, and I came to uh, this week, I learned what it means to graft a tree. So uh, 
this was fascinating to me. So uh, in case you don't know, what grafting is, is uh, if, if a tree has a broken branch, you can get a, a branch from a different tree about the same size and you can connect them in such a way that this new branch begins to grow. And the way you do that, the whole process is called grafting, right? So if you have a branch, let's say this is a branch, and you have, uh, right, it's broken off right here, and you go get another branch from another tree, it, you need to do a couple of things. You need to cut a slit in the branch that's connected to the tree, right? So you have a slit. And then on the other branch, you have to sharpen off the corners and uh, to kind of make like a little, like a, 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 a file kind of. And you just insert it, you wrap it, you and you have to take care of it. You have to, some people tape it, some people put bags around it. I, I saw so many different uh, ways of grafting, but uh, you do that, and eventually this, this second branch becomes a part of this tree. I was reading of one guy who has grafted so many different apple branches to his tree that he almost has apples year-round because you can get apples different times of the year. And I, was just, I just thought that was fascinating. You see, Paul is painting this picture that sometimes people fall, that sometimes the branches fall. And when they fall, they're still being invited to repent of their ways, to admit that the, the way of that tree is better than the way of the branch. And, 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 and Paul says that if the, the branch is willing to accept that, God will place that broken branch into that tree, they will be grafted and they will become one again. And it's not just the branches from that tree, it's all branches. It says even wild olive shoots. It says even the Gentiles. See, Paul paints this beautiful picture where he says, he, he literally, uh, in this text, he, he, he says, uh, if you have fallen, right, if you have experienced the wrath of God, if you have made a mistake and, and you keep owning that mistake and God says, you know, I'm offering you forgiveness, but you keep choosing your ways and you get cut off, right? If you're one of those branches who chooses your own way, who thinks that you have more power than God, that your ways are better than God's, if that is you and you've been cut off, you've experienced God's wrath. Paul says, all you have to do is repent and God can graft you into this tree again because you will always, you will always be able to be made a part of this. God is inviting all of us, no matter what we've done, no matter how long we have chosen our ways over God's ways, he's inviting all of us to be grafted into God's uh, in a relationship with God and God's people. All of us, no matter what our sins are or how big they may be or how often we've lied about uh, uh, repenting, God says you are invited to be grafted into this again. Just repent. Now look, I've got to say this. There are always consequences to our actions. The wrath of God moves in our lives and shows us that our ways are not better than God's ways. And my hope is that if that is us, that we can be willing to admit that God's ways are indeed better. And if it's not, I pray you may come to know that God's ways are better. See, if I was sitting in front of John Chris today, I think this is what I would tell him. Tell him. I would say, look, John, you are forgiven. Grace does abound and all of us fall short. I have too. But here's what I would say too. I would say, John, the wrath of God wants to help you make sure that that sin has no more power over you. And I would ask him, are you willing to allow the wrath of God to help you overcome that sin? I want to ask you the same thing. You are forgiven. 
That's for sure. That's an assurance. The question is, will you allow the wrath of God to move in your life in such a way that you can overcome your sin, that you can put your sin behind you, that you can be, uh, uh, that God can make you a conqueror against your sin? Are you willing to do that? Well, here's what it takes. You need to, one, accept that God loves you and you are forgiven. But two, you also need to invite the wrath of God, the, 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 the part of God, the action of God that says sin is bad and we need to get rid of this. Will you invite God to move in your life in such a way? Beloved, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. The question is, Will you allow the wrath of God to be real in your life in such a way that you will allow God to help you overcome every sin and evil in your life? I pray that we will and that we may. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I give you thanks. God, it is... uh, It is so difficult sometimes to really sit and wrestle with our sin because after all, it's uncomfortable and we want to try to leave that behind. But but God, remind us today. Remind us that one, you love us and forgive us. But two, that Your wrath is a response against the sin in our lives. May we not shy away from it, but may we walk into it. Because God, I pray that our hearts may reject sin and evil as much as you do. God, that's my prayer. Today and every day. Amen. Never
Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope that uh, through our worship you were challenged. And I hope that uh, as we leave from our time together, you may feel me at least a little bit closer to God or at least willing to get a little closer to God. Before you leave, I want to invite you to do one last thing. I promise it's the last thing. I want to invite you to grab your phone. Maybe you're watching on your phone right now, but I want to invite you to grab your phone and I want you to text the word here, H-E-R-E, here, to the number 225-307-0662. 225-307-0662. And here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a, a separate text message with three links. The first one is to a connect card. Whether this was your first time or your 20th time, I just want to thank you for joining us. If this was your first time, I hope that uh, uh, you found this community to be a place where you can grow deeper in your faith. And so I want to invite you to fill out a connect card, whether, again, this is whether this is your first time or your 20th time. We really want to know who worshiped with us this morning. The second link is to a, 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 a prayer card. I want to I want to pray for you and I want to pray with you. So when you fill that out, I have access to that prayer request and, and I want to be able to pray with you and for you. The third one is to a giving link. If uh, maybe you were still praying about it through the offering or you missed the information, just click on that giving link and then it'll take you to our giving page and you can, uh, you can give easily this morning. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. I hope that... Uh, you, you may rest assured in the assurance that God's wrath is not here to destroy us, but to get rid of sin in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I want that for my life. So may we invite the fullness of God, the God who is loving and the God who responds with wrath, so that we may not only be forgiven, but that we may overcome all sin and evil in our lives. I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you have a fantastic week. Go forth in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us.